Welcome to the Across the Spoilerverse podcast. I'm your host, David Zaslav, joined by none other than Greg Alba, as always. I'm in a bit of trouble this week. Been, there's been lots of box office problems, and we're going to be breaking it all down in this video. Greg, how's it going? It's going well, David. Much better than whatever you're experiencing on your end. I didn't know you were British, David. It's good to yeah. know. It's good to know you Brits taking over our American companies, our Warner Brothers and all that. Everything Just good on your end, friend? Yeah, really good. Yeah, I'm actually feeling uh, last week I was a bit worn out and a bit exhausted because of that bloody Craven trailer. But this week I'm back. I'm operating at 90%, which is pretty good for me right now. And this, yeah. I promise you, this is going to be our best episode ever. Every week uh -huh. I promise you that, but I mean it this time, yeah. I think you're so, going to uh, kill it with the conversations today. We got a lot to talk about, people. We got a lot. Paul, mm. I think we got to go into it. So first thing I'm going to ask from the audience is that you guys leave a like on this video. Secondly, here's the topics we're going to go over. There's chapters if you guys want to hop around. Flash bombing again. Warner Brothers catastrophes. Jonathan Majors is in court. Ben Affleck on Deadpool 3. And a little tidbit from James Mangle where he did a variety interview where he said some stuff that we found very interesting. But Paul, I think mm. there's one thing we both want to kick this off with right away. And it's a continuation, a sequel from <laughs> this topic that never dies but the movie's yep. dying, but it never dies for us. We talk about it almost every podcast now. The Flash bombed yet again, and it's doing even worse. What are the numbers, Paul? So the numbers right now, and this is according to comingsoon.net, The Flash may end up losing Warner Brothers $200 million at the end Ooh. of its box office run. Crazy. So it grossed an underwhelming $55 million at the domestic box office last week. It's second weekend, yeah? It's dropped down to $15.3 million, which, Yeesh. if we're going percentage-wise, that's 72% down. And that is basically a massive, massive drop. The only film, just to give you a kind of hint at where that's at, the only film that's had a, a bigger drop than that, comic book movie-wise, is Morbius. So, I mean... There's this weird thing with box office and second weekend drops where they make a big deal out of it and they're like, oh, it dropped 50%. Now, when your film does really well that first weekend and they're like, it dropped 50%, I'm like, that that's quite a big, you know, it's not, they're still making a lot of money even with half the revenue coming in. When, you, when your movie does terrible first weekend and it has a 72% drop, that is crazy absolutely abysmal that is crazy like fair enough if it was doing well and it had a it had a big drop you can understand it because it's percentages but if it's doing bad and it still has a massive drop boy david zaslav i'm i'm in the hot seat right now i'm in trouble i'm thinking have i messed up yet um so yeah I, i'm really really surprised that it's been it's came out this badly i think it's now in third place across the spider-verse has rocketed back up to number one obviously the last week people have been Whenever something like this happens, they're like, oh, is it superhero fatigue? I think when Across the Spider-Verse is back up at number one, it kind of negates the point a bit. How are you feeling on it, Greg? I think it's hilarious at this point, Paul. This is some of the sad, funniest it? news. It's sad. It's sad. Really sad. And funny yeah. at the same time. Just because this this journey with this movie of the amount of rewrites and production delays and and how long, how long you guys like you and I have been talking about this film and mm. the constant controversy surrounding its star and what will this movie ultimately amount to, the buildup, the hype, all this. And for it to, this, this should be, you see, like it was, it's been a crazy few weeks going into the summer box office as we had Guardians, Spider-Verse, Transformers. Um, there's just been so many films. I know there's one I'm missing, but there's been so many films that have been coming out. And Flash had the opportunity to not have to worry about the next week because they didn't have any competition releasing that could really go against it. It's, it has this two-week window where it should be just lighting the box office on fire. And it went down to third place and Spider-Verse climbed back up. There's something yeah. kind of funny about what's happening with this movie because of the insane amount of hype around it. And I don't even know if it's going to do well on video on demand because clearly the word of mouth in this film, it's just not good. It's fun. It's, it, I can't help but kind of laugh at it because it is a sad it, thing. I mean, okay, yeah, no, I'm looking like a total asshole right now for do. saying it's kind of funny. At the same time, come on, guys. There's something humorous about 
just how bad this film is tanking after the incredulous levels of hype this film's had for so many years. It's kind of unprecedented. It's like when that there's that meme of that guy standing at the window laughing, looking in, and it just says sickos on his T-shirt. I feel like you're, you're kicking a man when he's down right now. You know, I'm David Zaslav over here. I'm not having a good time. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely unbelievable. that it's Because we thought, you know, it, it will under... Like, our expectations were low. But holy shit, to have it drop down to this amount is absolutely unbelievable. Um, as a massive DC fan... You know, I, I love the Snyder stuff. Um, I'm really into that. Matt Reeves, Batman, love that. Joker. The DCEU, you know, once they started steering it in their own Justice League direction, I kind of went off it a bit. Um, I, I, I like Black Adam, I will say that. Shazam, mm-hmm. I had fun with those films. Um, Wonder Woman, obviously, I enjoyed Aquaman. But I, I feel like there should be a full reset of everything. And... This kind of indicates to me that the audience has completely abandoned these movies. Now, John Campier, he actually brought up a really interesting point. I'm someone, yeah, who's been fully on the James Gunn, what are you doing, you idiot? You've announced this universe doesn't matter anymore and you're expecting the the movies to make money. Now, John Campier actually did a very good story where he talked about this guy who... I'll, I'll butcher the story, but I'll tell you it. There was this guy who... Get, went out one day, put a nut on the floor, a squirrel came over, ate it, and then coughed. And then the next day he did it, put a, a, a nut on the floor, peanut we'll call it, squirrel came over, ate it, coughed. The next day he put an almond nut down, the squirrel came over, ate it, and coughed. And then he went, it must be the almonds that making that's making these squirrels cough. Like I said, completely butchered it. Um, but what that basically means is that all of these movies were bombing. If you look back at Shazam 2, um, but basically, sorry, if you look at everything before James Gunn announced that these movies were, were basically a part of a dead universe now, they were still bombing anyway. So we're not really sure if we can blame it on the Armins, which are James, which is basically James Gunn just announcing that this stuff doesn't matter anymore. And there is a high possibility that this movie would have bombed anyway. <laughs> Um, I don't think that the, the situation with James Gunn helped, but when I've been looking at the reasons for why the Flash bombed, why the Flash flopped, there's so many different things that you can point your finger at and go, well, it flopped because of Ezra, or it flopped because the Batman and it's 30 years old, or the VFX were terrible and they leaked on Twitter everywhere, or they did screenings months and months in advance, or, you know, there's so many different reasons working against this film that I don't think you can point to one and say, this yeah. is why it bombed. It's just so many different things that held it back. Whereas when you compare it to what's basically its Marvel counterpart, which is No Way Home, I've said, you know, this is DC trying to do a No Way Home for their studio. When you, you, you look at the things that No Way Home had in its favor, it was a multiverse movie before the multiverse thing had been played out. You know, you put you, you put your boy Tom Holland against Ezra Miller in terms of star quality, the person leading the ship. I'm just, I'm gonna say Tom Holland wins out every time. You put Michael Keaton against um, you know, Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire. I feel like the though I love Batman Returns, I love Batman eighty nine. I feel those movies probably the Spider Man ones probably have a bit more love towards them just because of. You know, that they basically, well, Tobey Maguire basically revitalized a lot of the superhero stuff along with the X-Men and Blade. Now, look at the villains, General Zod. Okay, look at all the villains in No Way Home. Ton of them, brilliant ones. And then lastly, Sasha Kaye, she's sort of your side character. Who's the side character in No Way Home? Doctor Strange. So even Doctor Strange is like a massive character at this point. So you can kind of see why No Way Home had a lot of things working in its favour. Kevin Feige didn't come out before and say, look, this movie might not matter. Um, you obviously didn't have all the controversy surrounding the star. The VFX got finished. I mean, there was a ton of leaks with No Way Home as well, but they seemed to hype up the movie, whereas the leaks here, it seemed to kind of be like, oh man, this is this doesn't sound good. So yeah, I think um, unfortunately The Flash is just a victim of a number of different things and there's a a lot of blame to go around. But when the box office is this low for the opening weekend and then this bad for the second one, I'm at a point now where I think 
just get rid of the DCEU. We've had our fun, it's good, but I want DC to, you know, I want them to keep making DC movies. Yeah. Um, and I think if the franchise is in this state, you're going to have such a difficulty. Investors, they're not going to want to put money into superhero movies in general now, I think. I think they're realizing it's quite a big risk and it's not the the license to print money that it used to be. So investors are going to be, you know, they're, they're going to be a bit more picky with their superhero films and studios are as well. I think in general, Hollywood's in quite a bad state right now. We, we're constantly talking about bombs every week and there's lots of projects that they've spent lots of money on and they're not all guaranteed hits anymore. Uh, COVID, obviously the streaming, there's lots of different factors that have kind of killed off people going to the theatre and the fact they're releasing a lot of movies three weeks after they're in the cinema now as well just lo- so many different reasons to get into but yeah I-, I feel like the dc brand at this point if it's not a standalone film it's bringing this baggage with it mm. of the dceu and people not being interested in that yeah i think warner we i mean this is we should just talk about warner brothers the current state of warner brothers and we should talk yeah, about next topic yeah, we, that's what I'm transitioning us smoothly. That's crazy. That's crazy how, how professional I am. We should talk about Warner Brothers. And I wanted to touch on a couple of DC because I know we, we've talked about it before. <laughs> because, you know, we have the we have Aquaman and Blue mm-hmm. Beetle coming out. And it's going to be crazy when they do. And I, I think they're going to try their best to distance. Like, I think Aquaman is trapped because, yeah, it's it's Aquaman 2. <laughs> like, there's no way around it. I think it's trapped to be just associated with the DCEU, which it is. Uh, but it needs to have that standalone effect. And, of course, same thing with Blue Beetle. As much as you try to say, no, 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 we're... We're reeling in, we're reeling in Jaime Reyes. He's he's part of the D. He's the first DCU character. I think it's still going to be negative. If anything, they should have made that release after Aquaman. Then so that way, there's no confusion on that. If you really want to like pitch that narrative to the audience, so they have that. It's kind of like they're just they're waiting to release it because I've, I've read reports that have been saying like flash could have probably, they would have lost less money if they just released it on streaming or not release it at all. As Warner brothers, you know, obviously around the time of Zosla, they've inherited, there's so much debt to it. And they've been on this crazy downward spiral. Like, of course they've had some hits here or there, but they have overall been just uh, a, a nightmare of a situation when like AT&T bought them out and then they had the whole thing during the pandemic where they panic released all these films on HBO Max same day and day uh, the day in theater release and as well as on streaming. And then they pissed off a bunch of filmmakers and talent and actors and actresses. They just pissed off a bunch of them. So not only are they having a hard time financially rebounding, their reputation with creatives has also been tarnished. They still have some loyalty, so they're trying to do some things to bounce back, like they have uh, Michael DeLuca and Pamela Abdi, who have a really hot, they're very much revered for being people who really respect talented artists and try to find original filmmaking, but right now, Warner Brothers, they keep, sh- weren't they just in, there? you might know more about this than I do, weren't they just like being reported, I saw it on Twitter at least, saw people really complain about something like the music license rights or something like that, that they're, yeah. they're selling off and then also making another deal with Netflix to hand off some more HBO shows and stuff so they could stream it there. Like they're desperate for, for money and they're just in so much debt right now. Yeah, so Warner Brothers have sold half a billion of their IP and products, the, um, the music licenses to a lot of films. And it just feels like David Zaslav, a.k.a. me, has come in and he's just selling off scraps. He's trying to pick the entire organization clean of what he can sell and, you know, shifting things over to different studios and just getting as much money in the door as he can. According to the figures that were released, Warner Brothers spent $1.1 billion on marketing Shazam 2, The Flash, Aquaman, and I think Blue Beetle as well which is absolutely insane because they're not going to make that money back. And you're, you're taking another loss there. You know, David Zaslav, he loves these bloody tax write-offs, wouldn't even release Batgirl, wouldn't give that, wouldn't even dump it on streaming. He wanted all the money recouped back from that. And it's just insane how the studio's operating now. It doesn't feel like a centre for 
the arts or things from the soul. It's just basically a complete corporate mentality where it's what can we sell? How can we get any bit of money in? And what can we use as a tax write-off? I'll be surprised like if they said we're, we're just cancelling the flash screenings and saying that it was only a two-week window release and we're just getting as much tax back as we can. I wouldn't be surprised by that. I think at the moment it just feels like they're gutting it for parts and trying to get whatever they can out the door. And it's not the best place to start with the DCU. Now, Warner Brothers, they've been accused of studio meddling in the past and a lot of it feels like what they've... like. I, I obviously don't know the, the background of it, but I kind of feel like Gunn's almost been forced into this position when he signed the contracts and he was told, look, mate, we want you as the full creative head of the brand, but you've got to also promote these films and pretend they're mm -hmm. part of your universe. So, yeah, I kind of feel like that's gone on, and that's why James Gunn's been so front and centre with these films, coming out saying it's the greatest comic book movie of all time. Why have, Why isn't everyone watching it? You know, going to premieres, stuff like that. You don't see Matt Reeves, my, belt, my boy Matt Reeves, you don't see him attending premieres, you know what I mean? Yeah. Even well, though he's got a DC franchise, it's not... It feels like something that we don't know about is going on behind the scenes where they're like, you know, you, you kind of have to, if you want to be the head of DC Studios, you better bloody come out and say DC's making the greatest movies of all time. That's another thing that I think really worked against the movie. Because, yeah. there, I mean, a big part of sales that I've heard forever is you want to under promise but over deliver. And you are just way over promising <laughs> at that point to the point that after James Gunn said that when they had the CinemaCon screenings, everyone just kept going. It's not like one of the best movies. That, it's not one of, it, that became the thing, which instantly downplays uh, the Flash's uh, response and then how people if people are interested in it. And it also kind of makes you question some credibility with, you know, again, <laughs> questioning the credibility of like DC and Warner Brothers when you oversell something to that point. Uh, that, and that's something I don't think we actually really brought up last time because not, I don't, not many people have come out being like, yeah, it's one of the best ones ever made. But yeah, yeah to, I, to your point, there is, there is so much that they're working on. The one part of it that, because I did read this Variety article from... Uh, I think it was on Variety. Yeah, yeah, it was a Variety article where they had Michael DeLuca and Pam Abdi. As much as we can just keep shitting on Warner Brothers, they are these two producers who, like, they were with MGM prior before this uh, for a little bit of time before I think Amazon bought them. Uh, everyone, correct me if I'm wrong on things. I read this a couple days ago, so correct me if I'm wrong on anything. But when looking into their history, like they've produced a lot of films that are well regarded critically and, and have also made a lot of money. And they didn't really pull that off with MGM. But bringing them over here, one thing that they're also trying to tap into as well, is, and I'm sure you might have heard about this, is they're trying to get Christopher Nolan back themselves. Yeah. And they've, and they've yeah. had Christopher Nolan like doing some parts of post production for Oppenheimer on the Warner Brothers lot. They gave him like a seven figure bonus check in good faith saying like, no, there was no like incentive to it. It was good faith when really like they admitted they, they want to get, uh, they want to get Christopher Nolan back in, but they also still want to shift more of their content towards everything they're putting out. They want to keep the focus over the next 10 years on still a theatrical release. And even Todd Phillips, who, you know, obviously works with Warner Brothers for the Joker films, uh, said that he, saw that like Warner Brothers like the greatest studio to work for and then in the past couple of years it hasn't been that at all but then having these guys uh, running the show because you got James Gunn running the DC Studios department these guys are running like all the other shit you know all the other films yeah. and to have them here is a lot of people might not really know who they are like only like people who follow film I like I wasn't even entirely super familiar with their filmography but looking into their track record of things they've done I'm like oh okay they that not only have they done good movies, but filmmakers and talent really feel supported when they're working with them. So this could be a step in the right direction to get things back on track. But right now in the muck of things with Warner Brothers, it has been just a a constant battle with people because it's, it's like even when the Snyder, remember like it feels like, feels like a thing of history, but when, you know, the, the people, the, the championing for Snyderverse to return, that's never going to, die but it's not as loud as it once was 
And there was a time where, yeah, that all the attacks were against Warner Brothers. So it just seems like it's been a compounding. Like the the Flash to me is the ultimate representation or like the ultimate metaphor for what Warner Brothers has been over the past couple of years. And the Flash is like the ultimate byproduct <laughs> of, the, of all that, yeah. where it's just so much compounding uh, things of where you can be like, well, here's what went wrong. Here's what went wrong. It's not, you cannot say it's this one thing for why Flash failed. It's a bunch of reasons why it's failing. And same thing here is with Warner Brothers has been just this compounding effect. And I, de- I didn't even really think about how much I'd have to work to bounce back. But because like they have Barbie coming out, which I really can't tell if it's going to do well or not. I, I have I'll no... I'll stop you there. I I know there's a lot of hype for it. I don't think it's going to do well. And I'll tell you there. why. I lean there. Because men... I just I can't I don't know any men who are going to be like I want to go see Barbie and I know we, I we really should all be on board. <laughs> I'm okay, well you're the first one I've spoken to, but just general normies that I know they go down the pub on a Friday night. You know they they eat their roast dinner on a Sunday. I go, you're going to see Barbie? They look at me like I've just uh, I've just asked them a really personal question about like do you do you still love your wife? The, the, it, I'm crossing a line with it. They just think you are. I'm not seeing new Bobby. Are you, are you crazy? So uh, obviously Oppenheimer's out the same day as well, which is uh, it's not maybe not a good look for Warner Brothers to be trying to get Christopher Nolan back, who's releasing a film at a rival studio on the same day that their next big film is. Um, I don't know. It, I think the plot of it it's going to basically hinge on that, and I think word of mouth is going to be very. It, it's going to have to win men round because. Unfortunately, you know, for better or worse, women will happily go see yeah. a, a male-centric film, but men, it were very difficult to to get out. I mean, it should change. Men should be more forthcoming with wanting to go see female-led films, but I think Barbie is pretty much the epitome of um, a, a woman character, almost, and, and men are just... I'm going to get cancelled, but I'm trying to word this in the best way possible and as respectful as possible. But you, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, yeah? Well. You shouldn't have started it, a podcast. Yeah. There's lots of uh, men out there who who might not be day one Barbie ticket buyers, especially when Oppenheimer's out the same day. I mean, if it comes down for me, personal preference here, I'm probably going to go see the new Christopher Nolan movie. We should have got a woman on to argue that point. (laughs) Katie, my wife's not in that. We're speaking for men and and, and men. um, uh, Yeah, I mean, obviously a lot of men would. I'm sure there's plenty of men. We're going to get nothing but comments with Barbie. You. I'm sure there's plenty of guys yeah. who would love to see Barbie, but I get what you're talking about with like general audiences, you know, like I'm sure there's a big portion of men, especially who are like, no way I'm not going to watch that. Or my girlfriend's going to yeah. force me to watch it or something like that. Yeah, no. I, and the th- that's the interesting thing about Barbie. Like, I think Barbie's a fascinating part of what Warner Brothers is doing because when you really break down what they're doing with Barbie, I'm not even exactly sure who this movie is for Bar- like I really want to see it it looks like one of those things where it's an expensive film made by you know uh, an independent filmmaker and it looks like they gave her pretty good amount of carte blanche I would say hopefully according to her but you know there's like Barbie's skewed towards little girls right that's the who the yeah. who Barbie's for but then so much of it feels like it's adult material at the same time so I'm yeah. like, I don't, and a lot of it seems to be like a commentary you, on corporations and stuff. Like, I don't really know mm, who this is for. <laughs> you worded it how I should have said it. Barbie is made for girls, so it's not initially that appealing to a 35-year-old man to go and see it. That's how I should have said it. You panicked. Um, the Lego you, you movie. so caught up in yeah. worried about getting canceled. You just said That's it. Just said too many words. <laughs> too many words. Paul. This is... This is why I script videos normally because I can go back and rewrite stuff. Whereas when I'm just mumbling on and talking, I'll come out with some uh, rubbish that I'll, I'll think the next day and think, oh no, I shouldn't have said that. Whereas when I script it, it's fine. I can record it, change it, delete it. But these yeah. these podcasts where we're doing it live, baby, ain't no cuts in this. You got to um, take, the, the, take the risk, man. <laughs> take the risk. And, you, and yeah. then, we'll, then we'll get engagement when people yell at us and say we're wrong. We talk for an hour, but people will point out. You know, this, mm. we'll get a bunch of comments. Everyone's saying the same thing. So. 
I've been exposed as hating Barbie and it's going to destroy my reputation, <laughs> I worry. Uh, but the Lego movie was a good example where Lego is obviously marketed to kids. It's got those adult jokes in, but you can, it's an animated movie where kids can go see it and it's totally fine. I don't know if there's going to be that big appeal for for young kids to go see the Barbie movie. And I feel like a lot of parents will be apprehensive as well because it kind of, I don't, I don't know if this is right, but I kind of get the feeling that, you, like you said, it is more geared towards adults. So I don't know if parents will be like, oh, I don't want to risk taking my kids to see this in case yeah. it is, you know, they might drop a big a big joke in the middle of it that I don't really want them knowing. Well, they had that, that, um, that beach off joke, you know, which obviously is a reference, a sexual reference. So okay. they had that beach off joke. Did you remember that joke in the trailer? I didn't really. Well, I think I was abroad. No, I wasn't. I was on holiday. I wasn't abroad. I don't know why I said. I it. didn't have time just one to of those watch the Barbie trailer. <laughs> um, but because you were, why I said it was because you were having your wedding, and I'm now vicariously projecting your life onto mine. You, you were having a nice wedding weekend, and I remember you panicking because it was about the trailer was about to come out, and you were like, "Well, my choices are record a reaction to the Barbie trailer or go and get married." I'm like, Greg, obviously you record the reaction. Yeah, um, I did both. I don't. Yeah, I don't think I actually watched it. Uh, well, yeah, there's a couple I, of adult jokes I in there. The, yeah, I watched the 2001 parody, that yeah. trailer. You know yes, where? The, yeah, you know that was the first one. Um, yeah, didn't watch, and I watched bits of the the second one and kind of just turned it off. I think. Um, I realized it's not for me. This oh. I looked yeah, in the mirror and realized I wasn't a two year old. Girl. Get out of the room. Yeah, uh, my yeah. friends all walked in and went, "What are you watching? The Barbie <laughs> trailer." <laughs> So yeah, me, me and my, my group of mates will all be there first yeah. first showing. Uh, it's called satire, it. people, to, for, for Paul's sanity so we don't end this video. And then he's talking to me like, should I cut this out? <laughs> it's called satire. Yeah, I not. will. I'll 100% hit you up and go, should I cut this out? <laughs> I think with it being we, we Bobby, clarify though, every okay. single time a joke. <laughs> it's like, this is purely just a joke. We know this is not. You know what my big issue yeah. is? Uh, when I'm nervous, I laugh. And it makes me... He seemed like I care even less. He's like, he's laughing about not liking Barbie. Get him. <laughs> but yeah, I'm sure no one watching Talking this channel. Barbie was so not on the agenda today. <laughs> 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 this is completely overshadowed. <laughs> the yeah. I just think it's so funny. <laughs> I feel like I've let loads of people down. I'm sure people watched my channel and, and they thought, oh, I bet he loves Barbie. But now they know the truth. And uh, unfortunately, there probably won't be a Barbie ending explained on the channel. <laughs> So, Wait, do you sorry, really not want to? Because you know, I really want. I was stressing out about it. Like, I really want to see this movie. But do you? Do you really not want to see it? Like your personal um, feelings. I probably will. I, I probably will see it eventually. But it's not a day one. I'm not choosing it over Oppenheimer. Nolan set off a right. nuclear bomb. Yeah, I'm going to see that film. <laughs> he's he said he said some comment in the week about how people who've watched Oppenheimer left it very traumatized. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, sign me up. Sign me up to that. Yeah, that's not to ruin my life. It's so yeah. long. Um, yeah, there's a lot of long movies coming out too. We could just go on yeah. a tangent about why are movies so goddamn long? <laughs> like freaking Mission Impossible is two hours and forty three minutes, and then the next week is Oppenheimer. <laughs> like, Jesus, man, these movies are so long now. Flash was Indiana like Jones as well. How long Indiana was that? Jones, way too long. What way are your thoughts long. on that? We're going to a new segment, Indiana oh, Jones, because we've got him in the thumbnail. Yeah. That's what, what are your What's your reaction? I um, I did not really like it. Uh, my short version did a review. You could listen to the whole thing. I actually really liked that review. Um, I thought I I had to edit that one myself, and I was like, you know what? I like the way this one turned out. This was fun. Yeah, my my basic summation is this: is like this movie essentially has three acts but 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 a prologue in the beginning right so like four acts i guess the prologue is fine young indiana jones the age it's it's fine it's it, you know it's a it, it's trying to capture the spirit and i'll admit that it like i overall enjoyed it de-aging mixed back give you guys like a really short version like our review is like 18 minutes long doesn't sound like you're giving a short version because you're explaining that you're giving a short version. Yeah, I'm trying, man. Now I'm nervous and I'm thinking too much. Is this too long? <laughs> um, in my head now. <laughs> and then act one, when you cut to old man Indiana Jones today, 
I thought it was great. Everything you see on the trailer with Moon Day and, and on like the parade, I actually, I, I loved all that. I thought it was really exciting and different and fresh. And then the rest of the movie uh, just sort of feels perfunctory and rote and really loses a lot of the spirit. It becomes like the action scenes are really like there's a lot happening, but it's not exciting. And um, the finale I could see being like I know the I didn't even say this in a review. I know the finale is going to be divisive because there's a moment. Won't say what where Harrison Ford is giving this lamenting something like the most dramatic thing you've ever seen Harrison Ford say and do in the Indiana Jones franchise. And half of our audience was laughing hysterically at what was going on. I wasn't, I wasn't laughing, but I was amused by how half of the audience was laughing at it. Um, it's going to be divisive there, but yeah, I, I ultimately felt, cause we have this James Mangold article and you sent it to me. And I, I don't have this exact section pulled up, but I screenshotted it for you where I was like, this is exactly what my problem with this movie was, uh, was that James Mangold, if you, it's how, it's what I said about guardians of the galaxy, it, if whoever takes over that franchise with, whenever they do a new guardians, if you try to do what James Gunn did, you will fail. Bottom line, you're, you're just going to look like you're trying to be James Gunn. And that word trying will be very much underscored. And Mangold in this variety interview, he practice he does admit, like, I just I'm trying to just do what Steven Spielberg did. It's pretty much the whole time. Yeah. And and the first act of that movie on Moon Day, because that's so much divorced from what's typical in Indiana Jones, is when James Mangold's really doing his own thing way more. And so I really enjoyed it. And it's got this uh, breath of fresh air and this confidence. And then and then act two, like most of the movie is like a, a, a lack of like Steven Spielberg couldn't even do Steven Spielberg for Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. So why would you try to do Steven Spielberg when he couldn't even replicate being Steven Spielberg? Uh, so, yeah, like it, it was it just lacked a lot of energy and, and and fun and it was a little bit it was boring i was i was i was actually pretty bored like i i actually liked the finale um but it wasn't enough to save most of the experience that i felt with vast majority of the film because the movie is forever it's a very very long movie so you know what i yeah. think the issue is as well with even Steven Spielberg can't do old Ske Steven Spielberg now Steven Spielberg Steven. a lot of those techniques they used are dead now it's just all very CGI heavy, swinging through the the vines and stuff like that. I watched Terminator Two today for a breakdown. I could not believe how much you know how good practical stuff looks. If you go back to those Indiana Jones movies, a lot of them are kind of they're done on a shoestring budget, all practical, obviously, except for the ghosts coming in. Um, but a lot of those things, if you did it now, the studio would be like, we need some CGI. We need it to be shut on blue screen, the entire thing. And they wouldn't have done it back in the day. And those are all dead techniques now. So you just don't get the feeling you can replicate it to a certain amount, but eventually it'll just feel sort of like a modern movie where it feels kind of fake and all. It was the same thing with the star Wars films where, you know, you watch the force awakens it's sort of leaning towards being a, a, one of those original movies, but it, it's just something off about it where it feels more like a fan film instead of a, an actual Star Wars film. And I, I also worry about James Mangold. I think he's going to get hit with the Star Wars director's curse, which I'm just coining this right now. So I've noticed recently, yeah, a, a lot of the time when Kathleen Kennedy and Lucasfilm grab a director, it's when they're in their prime. It's they're the hot new director. Get them. So Ryan Johnson got announced a trilogy. D and D, you know, they got they, we got told they're making a Star Wars movie. Oh um, yeah, Taika, I thought about that. <laughs> yeah, Taika Waititi, Josh Trank, Lord and um, Miller based, for Solo. Too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They they grab them. The hot thing with having to bring the Star Wars trilogy. James Van Gold, obviously, as well. And then they that director does their next project, and this is definitely the case in Taika Waititi. I feel like Ryan Johnson's kind of came back, but you know this, that project isn't well received. And then Lucasfilm are kind of stuck with this director who was the hot new thing. 
and all of a sudden there's this backlash against them and I I do worry that James Mangold might get it as well. He's came out, he's said something very stupid about Logan um, and appearing in Deadpool 3, saying that, oh, I'll try and get the quote up, the, oh, the I exact have it right quote. Here. That's the one thing I saved for this podcast. Brilliant. I have it right here. Cut to it? Greg. Cut to Greg, yeah. Cut to Greg. Cut to Greg. Um, he said, I can't say there's a part of me that doesn't wish that we'd let it be. But there was always going to be another Wolverine. There could be a baby Wolverine and a cartoon Wolverine. And as much liquid as they can squeeze out of that rag, they're going to try to. I don't measure my success on a movie like Logan with whether we ended the conversation. I ended my conversation. Which is kind of crazy coming from the guy who just made Indiana Jones. <laughs> I mean, yeah. But, it's, it's but that freaking Disney's going to try to squeeze as much as they can out of that Wolverine. <laughs> and I'm like, you, you yeah. just made Indiana Jones. That's what you're promoting in this interview right now. And he's making the a Star Wars movie from, too. Yeah. The call's coming from inside the house, James. Yeah. Um, Indiana, the, the Last Crusade, yeah? They made a movie called The Last Crusade. The Last Crusade. That was going to be the final film. They made that movie, and you're still squeezing stuff from the rag. So when when you're saying stuff like that, I mean, you just it just sets them up to get dunked on, really, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and I feel like the audience is gonna start to turn against them slightly if this bombs. It's gonna cause a lot of issues potentially at Lucasfilm. Kathleen <laughs> Kennedy, I mean, uh, the guy could become another Ryan Johnson. I like Ryan Johnson, but the amount of crap and uh, bad feelings people have online towards him because of the last jedi it's it's rare i go on twitter and someone's not talking about ryan johnson messing up the last jedi unfortunately right. i think the guy's fully redeemed himself in my eyes and i i don't think he was the problem with that film looking at it i think you know he's made enough good movies where you can say this guy's talented i feel that's the same with james mangold I'm going to see uh, first thing Wednesday morning, 9, 9 a.m. I've got my tickets booked for Indy. 9 a.m.? Um, You're going to watch this yeah. at 9 in the morning? Yeah. It's going to be a great way to start the day. Thanks for getting me excited for it, Greg. You've really sold it. Saying I mean, it's one of I'm the most hoping boring your expectations ever. are so goddamn low that you're like, everyone's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> The but then I worry when I... Up. It's going up. And I think audiences yeah. are going to enjoy it way more than... I don't know, man. It's kind of boring. It's kind of a boring film. It's just yeah. a, little, a little slow. I think James Mangle will be fine because unlike Ryan Johnson, who didn't have as much of a reputation, you know, like he, like James Mangle's had such a filmography for, for mm. years now, you know, and it's only just been going up, up, up. And, and yeah, I've, I've had that same concern too, where like it just takes that one movie to ruin you. I feel like he, if his next movie after this, is terrible is bad or something because because i wouldn't say this movie is terrible it's just a little boring <laughs> if that makes right. sense like it's not offensively bad it's just a little boring it's a little forgettable um the the but if his next like he's he really is really hyping up his swamp thing movie and like i like like have you seen his movie identity oh that would be such a good breakdown paul have you seen identity uh, no, I don't think I have. Oh, you would love that. Oh, my God. It is. It would be a perfect breakdown. Heavy spoilers fans. Pressure Paul into doing... A, I can't believe you haven't seen that movie. I think you would really love that film. It is I just might have. Twisty, t the one in the motel and John Cusack and James Mangold made it. It's got a lot of like these horror motifs throughout. It's like a psychological horror movie. Um, no, 2003. Really. No, I was drinking heavily back then. Uh, no, I was about 14 years old, I think. Uh, you'd have a blast with that. Okay, anyway, yeah. I, but that was like, I think, my first James Mangold film I ever saw before I realized. Because this guy has such a... That was one of the disappointing parts is he's got such a variety of styles and he, he knows how to jo hone in on genres so well that I am I was missing that f uh, from him here. Man, yeah, but like, this but by the is really of it. In front of me, it's, it, is, it sounds very hypocritical. <laughs> like, because... Yeah. I'll, I'll, last thing, I, I'll, I'll drop the subject here on it. But like, the last thing I'll say is that when I know that when you say this movie doesn't feel necessary, there's always someone who's like, well, what movie necessary? Why does people say that? I hate that. That last crusade, a part of why that was made was in response to the reaction from temple of doom. Even though temple of doom is, is like, like the, like loved by so many people. Now it was a response to make up for that. Like Steven Spielberg has, has said that. 
that he wanted to do it to make up for it. So there was a necessitation to providing that film, and it shows to many people that's their favorite one. Um, I'm subjectively speaking, of course, for me, that's my favorite Indiana Jones movie. Yeah. And then, and then this does not feel necessary. It doesn't feel like a swan song by the end of it all. It really, I, like, I, I had that was one of my first thoughts when it was done. I was like, this really felt like an unnecessary film. Like, we didn't need to make this. And it's, I don't usually say this is an unnecessary film. However, for this one, I was like, this, this really felt unnecessary. It doesn't feel like it makes up for Kingdom of the Crystal Skull or, or something like that. It, it really didn't need to be made. So for for him to come in here, I'm like, nah, man, you just wanted to make your, like, I love so many of your films, but it really seems like you you wanted to just, you know, make an Indiana Jones movie because you love Indiana Jones. But you're this thing you're criticizing for what they did with Wolverine, granted, Wolverine died, so there's a difference there. That is a massive difference. Just spoiled the ending. I thought I Indiana Jones might die, mate. No, no, no. I'm saying. I thought James no. Mangold was going to make Logan. Wolverine oh, died. That's what I'm saying. Okay, okay. I don't want people to. I would never spoil something like that. They're made, they announced yeah. Indiana Jones six by the end of this, guys. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> um, yeah. Like I said, I, I now you got I me there. It's like, how do it's I handle this? <laughs> when I'm like I'm talking yeah. about something else. I'm like, I don't even. If if I say he dies, it's a spoiler. If I say he doesn't die, it's a spoiler. <laughs> like, which way do I go with this to to reply here? Yeah, I I mean I I think a lot of people were excited to see James Mangold after after Logan, you know, doing that final Indiana Jones story, um, thinking it was going to be you know this franchise's answer to Logan. Doesn't sound like it is, unfortunately. No. But hey, man, we I'll, should talk I'll about uh, Jonathan Majors <laughs> transition. <Yeah>. Yes, <laughs> jeez. Now, first off, we we've been laughing and joking, but I think this is quite a serious subject. That we need to just come in now. We we have talked about how we're going to handle this um, before we we speak about it, and I think we just need to avoid speaking about the allegations. Um, there is a lot of honestly, there's a lot of back and forth, and you know. I, I'm seeing a lot of things that's really making me question everything that we've been told. I haven't actually publicly said what what I think, and I've just I, I haven't even made up my own mind to be honest. I think I I always want to wait and see until the full story's out there. And um, this is obviously something that people are going to come into with a lot of baggage because everyone's got their own personal feelings towards it. You know, there's people who think that he's being set up. There's people who think that he's going to get away with it. There's people who think that. He, he hasn't done it there's you know what i mean there's so many different things there's, there's people who just want want to see marvel movies and stuff like that and it's just such it, it it is very difficult to cover these things with a lot of respect and they're sensitive subjects as well so we don't want to wade in and you know it's not we're not going to have the same approach that we did on the barbie subject um so we're going to try and stick to what we think could happen and unfortunately I, i've been looking through a lot of things coming up and i just don't know how marvel can handle this to be honest because the the thing with jonathan majors is they've built so much of the upcoming phase around him and obviously they've delayed a lot of things as well and it's going to be if this is an ongoing trial how are they going to film those projects alongside it you know what i mean it, it's going to be so difficult to be like kang's off filming this movie um whilst jonathan majors is having to go and attend court for, for this heinous thing and it's looking at it i i really don't know how they're gonna handle it and it's it's crazy like because it's so built around him it's not if it was like a bit part i think they could get away with just recasting him um but looking at this they've obviously built the entire thing around him and there could be so much controversy coming out now there was a, a tiktok video released recently that kind of debunked a lot of the things that the claimant said but again it's like do you take the word of a tiktoker you, you know what i mean so there's so much it's such a crazy situation and very difficult to kind of wade through right so what do you think marvel will end up doing bear in mind they they have delayed things to be fair kang dynasty's coming out i think 2026 or 20 one of the years but secret wars is coming out 2027 so they've got four na years now between that like now when the trials started till to then yeah 
But well, how many how many projects is Kang going to be in up until that point? I mean, they're still releasing Loki season two, right? And uh, but October? that's in the can. That's filmed. Yeah. I mean, it, it was the same thing with Ezra Miller, where yeah. they filmed it all. It it was ready. So that was what they were saying. That's like the it next was too difficult. Yeah, it's too difficult to go back and refilm the Flash with a different actor because they've obviously shot scenes twice with Ezra Miller and with Kang being a multiversal character. I'm guessing that there's scenes where he and I mean the end of Quantum Mania, we've got several different Kangs interacting with each other, um, not to the level that they were in the Flash, but th- there was still a lot going on there. Well, you know, without yeah, without diving too much into the allegations, what I'll what I'd say is that because if, for people who don't know if they really want to find out what a lot were a lot of the information, I'm surprised in, in all honesty, I'm a little bit surprised that none of this is becoming as, uh, you know, popular in the zeitgeist as of course. Yeah. It makes sense. I'm not saying I'm not, I was being surprised, not surprised at the wrong word, wrong choice of words here. The, the, the bit you can go to insider and then that's where it breaks it down where the lawyer uh, pretty much, unveiled a lot of what they have and then a lot of what they what they have in support of Jonathan Majors for the incident that he is um you know defending himself against uh with his ex-girlfriend there seems like according to the defense and uh, and the mountains of like testimony and footage and all these other things pictures body cam footage there's a lot there's a lot in his in his side that seems to support that he could be innocent. And granted, that's just the defense's side. So, you know, we have to that's why there's gonna be a trial. We have to see how it plays out, what the prosecution is gonna be presenting. And then we heard about other other people who wanna come forward, but where he's his, he's focused on proving his case here with this one the, the one incident he got arrested for, right? Like that's where he has to prove his innocence. And I think overall <laughs> it's gonna sound strange to say. It's happening at the best time for him. Like this, is, he shouldn't be. It's not God. If he's innocent, like if he is indeed innocent, shouldn't be. Ha- it sucks. That it's happening at all for him. The fact that he has to yeah. fight this, it's happening at a, at a fine time for him. Because you we have the writer really strike, huh? I think I know what you mean. But you they have the writer strike, bad. and they and they have the SAG strike, which is more than. I mean, it hasn't been an, like at the time of filming this. We have till June thirtieth to find out. It looks like the SAG strike is going to happen where like everything's going to shut down with filming, <laughs> like everything's going to shut down. Like Marvel's not even going to uh, Comic-Con. Most studios are not going to Comic-Con now. Most pulled out because we have these strikes happening here. So in, in return, in return, in regards to Jonathan Majors, he has time to settle this and solve this. And in all honesty, like the, if he is indeed innocent, the way he's going about it is one of the smartest ways he can do it because he's not doing interviews. He's not putting himself out there to strongly associate, you know, his, his whole image with this. It's like, but he, at the same time, he knows he has to clear his name. So if he has the opportunity to clear his name, then excellent. Do it the way of the trial, the way how like Johnny Depp was able to clear his name via the way of the trial like that. That's the smartest way to do it, especially if he's able to legitimately prove that he is indeed innocent. Go that way. That way, I mean, there will always be people, even if he's proved innocent, who will, you know, make up their mind and yeah. assume he's guilty. However, it's like nothing will speak stronger than the court deeming you innocent after all this evidence and stuff, right? So he has the time to prove his innocence. The way he's going about it is smart. And I think Marvel also doesn't want another James Gunn firing situation on their hand where they fire Jonathan Majors uh, before this plays out. And and then if he's, you know, deemed innocent in the court of law, then everyone's going to be like, oh, Disney, Marvel, why'd you do and like, And then they're just going to get the same, they're going to get James Gunn situation again. So yeah, and they're playing it the smartest way. If everything was still like filming and they had to keep it going, then I'd be like, they're probably going to have to let Jonathan Majors go. Um but if they have these delays, because I believe his court trial, I believe it starts happening in August. And I imagine the strikes will, and all that will still be, like, we, he's gonna, he's gonna, there's plenty of delays now for him to, to buy him some time to prove his innocence, basically, because I don't feel like it. I mean, like, what was the Johnny Depp one? That was like, what, six, uh, six weeks? Something like that, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it started May last year, and then 
yeah kind i don't of. feel like this would go on as long as that and this is supposed to start in august yeah i mean from from what i've seen of the counter evidence he has a very strong case but right. then when i've spoken privately with people about this they've said well why hasn't the da just thrown out the case or why hasn't the judge <laughs> exactly. just thrown out the case and exactly. it's kind of like oh well i don't know and that's kind of why i don't like speaking on yeah. allegations and stuff like that because you just don't know you know we went there we haven't had the evidence as well and a lot of people are judging before they know the full story um i think obviously you have to take these allegations seriously as well uh, and it, it's such a, a bad situation but you know like you said you you might be right you know the, it's happening at a time where they have time to at least get the verdict out before things go into production and obviously with the movies being pushed back several years starring him it, it is kind of you know saying it's the best time for him to happen is a weird way to phrase it which is why you shouldn't have said it greg <laughs> but i understand what you're saying he he has opportunity here and at least the timing's not as bad as it could have been that's what you should have said the yeah. timing could have been a lot worse yeah now i'm gonna we haven't been cancelled we're, yeah. we're learning oh. how to phrase things <laughs> in real time yeah. that's what we're honestly working. like that, that's the thing when you're speaking on these things you just overthink everything you're saying because no matter what we say someone's going to get angry somewhere like I, I i said something about wonder woman 84 having a good third act and it was you what yeah, yeah i'll kill you <laughs> so this, when it's more sensitive like this it's even more difficult um but my worry is as well and i spoke about this on twitter the other day is, this is just more industry things we're not, we're not talking about allegations and stuff yet sure but by the time secret wars and, and it's kind of building off the back of the flash as well but by the time secret wars comes out in 2027 are people going to be tired of the whole multiverse thing now deadpool 3 there was a it's not a, a, a massive Paul, not, good transition i see what it wasn't you did. an announcement yeah i'm slick like that so it did. wasn't it wasn't an announcement but there was a report saying that ben affleck had been spotted on the set of deadpool 3 and that he was going to be reprising his role as daredevil you know the original maddie murdoch watch the extended edition version of daredevil it's got coolio, coolio. in it completely, completely cut from the main film but i tell you what that extended edition makes that film way way better it's really good so the response you would have thought would have been Woo -woo, ben affleck's back in another superhero movie coming back as a character that he said he wasn't gonna play where have i heard that before um but it's kind of been a lukewarm reception and i'm starting to think are people gonna be still hungry for multiverse stories come 2027 now i think secret wars has the potential to be the end game of multiverse movies i've been rereading jonathan hickman's run if you haven't read it everything building up to secret wars is absolutely incredible i'll, I'll not chew your ear off with it but i've been going back through it and if they can adapt this it's going to be the best multiverse story by far but will people even care greg i turn it over to you <sighs> It's weird. You asked me this. If you asked me this when Secret Wars was announced, even with the delay, I'd be like, of course, man. It's Secret Wars. I am there with I, I feel that concern, though, now, because even as someone who loves all this shit, I'm still going, oh, I'm already starting to get a little tired of the multiverse. <laughs> like I'm already, I'm already a little tired of it because it's not just Marvel that's doing it. You know, like everyone's doing the multiverse now. And by that point, if they haven't mastered how to truly sell consequences and personal stakes within your big comic book movies, when it comes to the multiverse, if they haven't really, because it kind of feels like a lot of it just sort of boils down to this, you know, something's colliding and <laughs> there's some collision of shit happening with universes, you know, fill in the blank with some science mumbo jumbo and then boom, that's what's happening. That becomes repetitive. It's the same thing how we got sick of like sky beams, you know, you start to, you start to need something real personal to latch onto. And I think everything ever all at once was like this. It doesn't help that an independent movie be, sort of became the standard for how to do how to excel at it, like a masterpiece of a multiverse movie to make it crazy hog wild at the same time to 
make it feel like truly personal and emotional. And these comic book movies often don't do like across the spider verse has been the best at come at like getting there. Right. And by the time we get to secret wars, I think we might, there is a bit of that concern, man. Uh, I feel like we might feel a little, I think everyone will still tune in. I think it just depends on the trailer and everyone who's in it. And it's like, how well have they gotten us to get to know the multiverse of the characters by that point? More than them just showing up and being like, hey, look, it's an alternate version of a character we know and there's a famous person there. They we need they need to be real characters by the time we get to Secret Wars is like the main thing you just gotta get down because if it's just cameo fest, it's not gonna cut it. I think Deadpool three would like that that could be really fun because there's this whole Fox universe associated with it. So they could do that whole Deadpool. I don't know. I feel like when yeah. it comes to vol- the problem with multiverse too is people often like overhype themselves, you know, with like the, yeah. the amount of craziness that, that they could get. It's called the multiverse, so you think like this is gonna be like you feel like No Way Home was crazy, man. They're gonna do so many crazy things, and No Way Home is a great example of like when he the Spider Man movies did a good job with multiverse overall, but the but by that point when you got a movie like that huge. I don't know, like I like Multiverse of Madness, but I wasn't like blown away by the Illuminati as most people weren't. It was like fun to see them for a second. So yeah, it's like whatever the multiverse ends up being by that point, we just need to have actual investment in whoever these other characters are. Because if it's just a big introduction of like, look, alternate Wolverine, alternate Iron Man, alternate, like if it just gets to that point where that's the movie, it'll, it's like, okay. It's cool at first, but yeah. it's not really that. Ex- it's like the excitement factor weighs off pretty quick, uh, quicker than I think a lot of us anticipated it would. I think the Hollywood's learned the wrong lesson from multiverse movies, and it's just becoming cameo fests. It's like, what actor can we get back? What, what, who can we get in? When that's not really the case. Now, you were talking about incursions before and worlds smashing together and how that doesn't feel like it has consequences i'll tell you why it does greg and this is what they do perfectly in the secret wars run (laughs) Uh, the no the peep the the reason that you feel this stuff is because the heroes who are destroying the worlds are people that you like and they hit a point you know they get lucky on the first couple of incursions where there's you know, the first one, they, they managed to push it away by using the Infinity Gauntlet and, and that sends the, the world spiralling back. And the Illuminati's like, oh, well, we've destroyed the Infinity Gauntlet trying to do that. We're not going to get another chance at it. And they're like, what should we do? And they're like, we're going to have to destroy worlds from now on. We're going to have to actually kill people. And Captain America's like, I'm not doing that. I'll join the Illuminati to save people. And I'll, whatever it takes, I'll make sure that, that we don't sacrifice any lives. And what Tony and Doctor Strange do is to just go, right, well, erase his memory. He can't remember anything that's happened. They erase Steve Rogers' memory. He wakes up and there's there's the Avengers run. So there's the new Avengers book and the, the Avengers book. The Avengers book is about Steve Rogers not remembering anything and just thinking everything's fine and just doing really cookie-cutter adventures. And the new Avengers book is about the Illuminati in the background going around destroying worlds, killing trillions of people and having to deal with the cost that comes with that and acting normal, like everything's okay. Like, oh, you look really stressed today, Tony. What's the matter? He's like, oh, nothing. Um, And they get given this eight-hour timeline and they basically have to figure out in that amount of time what the hell they're going to do. Do they let their world get destroyed and so on and so forth? Some worlds, they'll travel to it and Galactus will already be destroying that world because... Um, if you destroy the world in that universe, it stops the incursion, and um, because that's the main incursion point. Some universes, they'll go over and uh, like versions of the Justice League will show up, and they'll be like, "We'll we'll sort this out, and we'll try and be, we'll try and come to a peaceful resolution." And it just devolves into them fighting each other to the death. Doctor Strange sells his soul so he can get more power to f- destroy these worlds. And there's so much cost that comes with it to the point where the heroes themselves are just completely defeated by what they're having to do. And they're they're basically carrying out the murder of billions every couple of days. And what does that cost a hero? Now, will Disney do that? Um, No, but they did sort of touch upon it with the Illuminati destroying Doctor Strange to stop incursions and stuff. So I, I am hoping they do sort of go that way with it, but 
uh, if they do, I don't know. I think Hollywood's going to basically go. Don't ca- don't worry about what it costs their soul. Have you seen Ben Affleck's back? He's <laughs> wearing his dead. It will cost you. I was like okay, yeah, yeah. So yeah, read like, Secret that, Wars. That I hope sounds, sold that you. sounds like that is great. Like where you they. Infinity. I read the Infinity Gauntlet uh, comic, and I th- I think like the Infinity War and Endgame story is a is a really cool. It's like certainly not a one to one, you know. Uh, yeah, bring us some this far isn't, from yeah. it. But they take elements for sure that are like a strong adaptation, and I think there's a way to make that work. But you know, the lead up to it, they had a really strong focus on your films outside of the Avengers, uh, you know, Unity films. And I think that they need a really good that ship in order <laughs> before we yeah. we do the Secret War stuff. Because, yeah, I mean, like when I think of Multiverse of Madness, the real threat is Wanda, right? And not yeah. really like the incursion things happening. I'm not really concerned about that. I'm really like it was Wanda. And then uh, even in the Flash movie, you know, they had the. This is not. It's, I know it's not Marvel, but. At the very end, they're like the universes are smashed together. <laughs> I'm like I don't, yeah, I didn't know this was part of what's happening in this movie, but but okay, this is this is now a thing because that's what happens in all the multiverse things. So yeah, if every multiverse movie has that quality, that threat becomes diluted. So yeah, it's like they, that's why getting a strong handle. And bottom line is, I know a lot of people really thought Jonathan Majors did a great job, and I thought he did a great job in Quantum Mania as well. I best think there's scenes still a lot in that of film people. are him. I'm sorry? But the best scenes in that film are him. Oh, that, that one with him and Michelle Pfeiffer. Crazy. Yeah, undoubtedly. Best scenes. At the same time, there were a lot of people who even liked Jonathan Majors in it who didn't like the handling of how Kang ultimately was defeated in that movie, you know? So if you keep and having that effect and if Kang keeps getting showing up and getting killed off in some way, I mean, it could be Loki season two. You know, we've seen two kings get, you know, lose already or die already. Not really he who remains. He kind of want, he wanted that to happen. So that's different. He was still like in control even though he died. But uh, but if we get other, whatever kings we get moving forward, you know, we need, yeah, this is really important they get the Jonathan Majors shit in order <laughs> because we need that central threat. Like at the end of the day, Infinity War and all that, like, yeah, we're dealing with half the universe being wiped out. But that's not what you're really fearing. What you're really fearing is Thanos. And we need that as well for Secret Wars, that you can have your cool multiverse backdrop. But what's really going to matter most is the the actual physical antagonist who's walking around threatening our heroes. It could be Doctor Doom. could be, you know. It should Kang. be, yeah. Cause Doctor Doom's obviously the, the villain of Secret Wars. The heroes find out that he actually caused the incursion so there's the, basically this central figure called Mo- molecule man who exists the same in every single universe um he was built by the beyonders to basically be a bomb in every single universe um dr doom finds this out and he goes through every single reality and kills every version of molecule man and and he's basically trying to wipe out a, a, a virus in the background before it destroys the entire multiverse however in doing this it accidentally starts knocking Earths into each other, and that's when the incursion yeah. comes from. And so, like, I don't know, three hundred issues long. It's a lot to talk about, but I feel it, like it Secret surprised Wars should be two movies, don't you? I feel like Secret War should be, be. two yeah. movies. Oh. It really surprised me that um, Doom's not connected to this at all, because the rumors were that he was going to show up at the end of Wakanda Forever, mm-hmm. and then didn't. And I was like, but it's, it's Secret Wars. It would be like having Infinity War, but you have think of a marvel and filling quickly you have dr doom instead of thanos you know it doesn't really make sense um so we'll see what happens but so far i I just look at the i honestly look at the phase five slate and think that how is this building to secret wars because all of these you know armor wars how is that going to build to secret wars because it's very low-key and grounded stuff um I think Fantastic Four can probably do it, but Thunderbolts, stuff like that, Captain America, New World Order, I'm not really seeing the the seeds being planted here for Secret Wars. We will see, though, but just from what I know of the story, I don't know. So, yeah, yeah. is there any more to- topics to cover? Greg? I think we covered all of them. I think we're on track. I think we, we did a good job today. 
And I think yeah, I actually very... feel very happy with this. Yeah. And that means that we're going to get nothing but downvotes. And... <laughs> I'm going to get a message from Paul tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, oh, should never God. said that about Should've Barbie. Should put this out of the video, man. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks for joining us again, guys. Obviously, if you're watching us on YouTube and you want to listen to us on the go, you can go to Spotify, um, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, Across the spoiler verse, we're there. We're there for you guys. Wherever, whenever you want to listen to us, we'll be there. And yeah, and we've tried to make this thing, you know, a friendly sort of just sitting around, chatting about stuff, having a laugh. It's not a completely restrictive podcast where it's like you have to stick to the topic and you've got ten minutes. We want this to be more conversational, and we we hope you guys join in the on the conversation too. So yeah, drop a comment below. Let us know your thoughts. Do you disagree? Um, I was thinking of doing some stuff next week where we pick some comments to read them out so if you've got any questions that you think we'll have a, we'll have a quick scroll through and steal steal your ideas and say they're ours so uh yeah thanks a lot guys go to shopzeroedition.com as well if you've enjoyed the merch i'm wearing you don't have to wear it you just if you if you just want to buy it and that helps me out i appreciate that i'm wearing Greg, a me undies sweater today uh everything i wear is me undies oh, now with shop zero edition underneath my me undies that's what i do why is it on top of it if it's your undies? Uh, you know, I should have prepared for this one. Yeah. <laughs> My undies is, they just have sweaters, Paul. <laughs> I think you. this counts, yeah, I think this counts as a MeUndies brand deal and I'll be invoicing the company, right? In the next 10 minutes asking where the money is. There, uh, there so are yeah, thanks for four brands I would work with all the time. MeUndies, G Fuel, Manscaped, and Athletic Greens. Throw the other four. That All right, mate. Well, we're, we're not actually advertising for them. Jesus. I just, I'm just trying to put it out there right now. I just want to get it out there. We haven't done a single brand deal on this podcast yet. So I'm hoping mm. I can put it in the That's evening. why we appreciate we appreciate you guys supporting, liking the videos and stuff. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. We'll be back for the next one to talk about whatever, whatever the hell's going on. And you know what? I promise it'll be our best episode ever. You know, you got that yeah, heavy yeah. spoilers. Promise, baby. So I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot, Greg, for sticking with me. You take care, guys. Peace. Cheers.